if you've listened to everything we've set up until this point, you might be like, okay, I'm with you guys. I understand that, you know, if I'm a business owner with a product, um, that selling isn't evil. And, and I get all the points you've made so far, but I'm a musician with music and maybe some merchandise. How is that? How does that represent a future result that benefits fans? You are now listening to the Creative Juice Podcast brought to you by Entrepreneur.io. What's up, Indies? Welcome back to the Creative Juice Podcast. I'm your host, Circa. With me is our guest for this entire month, Jack McCarthy, our IndieX agency lead. How's it going, Jack? What's happening? It's going great. Thanks for having me on. This is a this is a super exciting copywriting month. Yeah, I'm super excited about it. Um, it's one of those things that has probably been the most resisted against in the indie community. I think a lot of indies understand they need to be able to sell, but it goes so much against their their sensibilities and and kind of the ingrained sensibilities of an independent musician, which is to be sort of countercultural, anti-mainstream, anti-corporate, you know, anti-selling. Yeah, for sure. And I think all of the all of the headspace that comes with that kind of attitude automatically puts uh, a lot of musicians at, at, you know, at aversion to even the word selling or being salesy. It seems like a yeah. cringeworthy topic to them. Yeah. And it, it's definitely frustrating for us as music marketers, because like, when someone says, oh, I just hate selling, they don't know, obviously, that I've heard that a million times before, but I have. <laughs> and, you know, and, and so when it comes across, I'm like, yeah, yeah, you don't you don't like selling, but you don't really know what you mean by that. You don't know enough about selling to know that you don't like it. And you have a, obviously, since you just said that to me, you have a misconception about what selling actually is. Um, and this is something that I, this is a journey I went through. Like I, fancied myself a contrarian countercultural George Carlin. I like, and, and I sort of, I outlawed these things in my mind as evil and as counterproductive to who I wanted to be as a human. Um, and I've changed my thinking on that dramatically over the years, just by lots of learning. Um, there's two resources that I want to point people to at the top of this podcast. If you go to entrepreneur.io slash episode 92, uh, there will be some show note links. And in those links, I'm going to put uh, an episode of one of my favorite podcasts, You Are Not So Smart, which is a very good podcast. And I'm going to point you to episode five called The Authenticity Hoax with this guest, Andrew Potter, who um, who is a writer. He, he wrote The Authenticity Hoax is the name of his book. And he's a researcher as well. And basically the point he's making in here is that we all fancy ourselves this thing that, that musicians fall into. We fancy ourselves countercultural against the mainstream and authentic. And we chase out authenticity at every turn. Um, when in reality, there's nothing more mainstream than being that. Yeah. Uh, there's nothing more mainstream than thinking you're against the mainstream and you're often not the 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 underground the authentic counterculture that that we covet in that mind mind state becomes the mainstream the mainstream is entirely comprised of that which was once thought of as authentic and countercultural and thereby the, the it loses all definition to say something is authentic or say, say something is counterculture or mainstream yeah, that's so good. Um, I'll have to check that that episode out. I haven't listened to it. Yeah, that sounds amazing. Um, and it's so true, uh, especially for creatives. I think we uh, it, it's just the way that our brains work in some element that we position ourselves as the the authentic hero that is going to uh, you know carry the banner or the cause of of being you know of being the thing that the rest of the world isn't. Um, whether that's, you know, yeah. fighting against the mainstream music industry, whether that's doing things differently than every other band that sounds like you, um, the, the story could take so many different forms. Um, but that's, that's yeah. such a good point that, you know, once, when you get into that headspace, everybody's doing that and it becomes the mainstream itself. Yeah. And, uh, he also kind of points to, uh, Potter in the podcast points to how authenticity isn't really a thing. I don't mean that like what we what we conjure when we think of authenticity isn't a thing, but the actual 
container we put it in isn't a thing. Uh, authenticity, you can't define it. In the medical world, if you can't define it and you can't test it, doesn't exist, right? Right. Uh, they, you know, like if you can't come up with a reliable, consistent, and and applicable definition for me, I don't know what you're talking about, you know? And and that's very true of authenticity. And Potter even says there's there could never be an authenticity detector we could wave at something like security guards checking you at the airport, which I think is a great way to think of it. Like, we don't know what we mean when we say something's authentic and we can't put it into words. We can try, but it ends up being this vague thing that kind of crumbles under any uh, speculation or further inspection. Um, and so, yeah, I I think that it's important for, for indies especially to realize that like, if you don't want to be mainstream, don't consider everything you come across that has a, a world to it that has its own language or that has its own, you know, uh, system of operatives and, and practices as inauthentic or as mainstream, because that's, that's a very, uh, reductionist way to view the world. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Uh, and I, I like, I like the, uh, I like the point you made about like, there's no, con there's no container of authenticity. I, and I would say there's no real container of inauthenticity either making those things binary. It's not really, it's not really a good worldview to have. Um, yeah. uh, you could probably even go so far to say is like, authentic isn't a destination. It's a journey. <laughs> I know that sounds kind of silly, but it's true. Um, and I think that, I think that that applies to exactly what we're going to talk about here today when it comes to copywriting and selling. Yeah, definitely. And, and it's, it's definitely my, you know, like I've, ex I've had to explore my own internal psyche to arrive at this place, but like eventually arriving at the idea that like, if I'm trying to sell something, and we're going we're gonna to really break down what selling something actually means because it takes many more forms than people typically imagine. But if I'm trying to sell someone something, but I'm not lying about anything I'm saying and I'm not not being myself and I'm me and I'm saying the things that I mean, how am I being inauthentic, right? Where's the inauthenticity? Uh, if you can't find it, it's not there. Right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It, it's, it's almost as if the, it's almost as if the assumed X factor of inauthenticity is just, it's only in the variable that says you're selling something. Everything else could be super authentic, yeah. but as soon as it comes back to, oh, but yeah, but you're selling something. So that makes this whole discussion inauthentic. That can't be. Right. And, and if you want to like hoist or foist onto someone that they're inauthentic when they're being their authentic selves in the act of selling you on a product or an idea or, or a song or a, a mode of thinking, you know, if you want to call them that you're kind of the dick, right? You're yeah, saying yep. like, you're coming here and telling this person that really, you know, since, since they are being their authentic selves, you're really just saying, Hey, I don't like you. I don't yeah. like how you are, you know? And that's kind of like, that's bad. So uh, that's an important paradigm shift. And just so you know, the people at the forefront of like uh, self-delusional uh, study, like like how we trick ourselves are out there saying like, no, nah, you're not a unique special snowflake who hates the mainstream. You're the mainstream. <laughs> <laughs> um and then on top of that, I also want to point people to an important YouTube video by one of my favorite marketers and people, Joe Polish, uh, literally called "Is Selling Evil." And a lot of what he talks about in that video, we're gonna we're gonna cover in a different context in this episode. But definitely check that out because in it, he really just kind of breaks down the concept of "Is Selling Evil." He does it in a way that's more relevant to business owners than it is to musicians. We kind of have to take it a step further than he does, but it can definitely open your eyes up to some important concepts. So uh, the reason that, I mean, we, we've planned to do this podcast episode for a while just because it's a common thing that we have to kind of uh, give people a, a mind frame shift on. But it's especially relevant. I recently saw a Gary Vee video on YouTube where he's talking to a group of people who all paid there to be with him, I'm sure. And he's talking about how he hates selling. And in the same breath, he talks about how he he recently released this wine called Empathy Wine. I think it is tied to a nonprofit or something like that. Yeah, but yep. since he came up selling wine, he figured I'm going to do something good and sell these cases of wine and contribute to this charity, I believe. And in that video, he talks about how the, it only sold 30,000 cases. Now, Gary Vee 
has a huge audience. If I were a marketer with Gary Vee's audience, I would presume I could sell 30,000 more, more than 30,000 copies of something, of some product. Um, but he kind of like in the same breath says like, I hate selling and I don't do it. And also that's why empathy only sold 30,000 cases and somehow presenting that as a good thing. And I was like, dude, that's bad. Like maybe if yeah. you had done some more selling, which is really, and we'll really define it in a second, but it's really just convincing people of a future state that, that is good for them or that is to their best interests based on what they're interested in. And, he, and like, if you're not doing enough of that, and your products falters as a result, and that product's tied to a good cause, that's not a good thing, dude. No, that's a terrible <laughs> thing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I think that we really need to break, like it's the most, there's nothing more mainstream than getting up there and saying, I hate selling. Oh, really? Like <laughs> fucking big, big surprise, dude. Like, yeah. like, like, it's just crazy. Like it's, it's like someone telling me that they like hate accounting. It's like, yeah, it's a job. It's something you have to do that is different from you just lying around playing video games, but you don't hate right. it. You know, like that's kind of a misnomer. So anyways, I want to get to the definition that Joe Polish provides in that video. And then we can spring off from there, which is that selling is intellectually engaging the right person in a future result that benefits them and compelling them to emotionally commit to taking action in order to achieve that result. It's intellectually engaging. So this isn't like mindless. We're not just trying to force someone through this without them thinking the right person. So we're not shoving something down someone's throat that they don't, that's not right for them. I was going to say, which is so often, uh, and I hate to break up the de definition here, but just to go into it a little bit, which is so often that's where people stop with their definition of selling. They say, yeah. oh, well, I'm going to be shoving something down someone's throat who doesn't want it. No, that is no. not what you're doing. <laughs> that is not what you're doing when you sell. Absolutely. And so th that's like, yeah, like th you're not, s you're not selling, you're bothering someone if that's the case. So that's not part of the definition. And then in a future result, it benefits them, right? That's an important part. It benefits them. If, if it was a future result that's not good for them, yeah, you're a grifter, you're a scam artist, you're a bad person, but that's not what selling is about. Right. Um, and then compelling them to emotionally commit to taking action to achieve that future result, which is part of becoming that. Now, if you can't do that with your product, selling isn't the problem. The, the, product, the product and how you think about problem. it and who you're targeting it towards is the problem. Yep. The, the product, how you think about it, who you're targeting it towards. If those parts of the definition of selling aren't satisfied, the selling is not the problem, you know? Uh, that's what I really like about this definition of selling is that it breaks down all of the parts of what selling is and points you to where the problems in your, if, if we want to call it your sales process, where they are, even your, your sales thinking process. The problem is not with the definition of selling or what it means to sell. The problem is likely with one of the pieces of that puzzle. Yeah. And, and I think a lot of people, when they think of selling, they think of used car salesmen. They think of the scenario where uh, this nice young couple saving every dollar, doesn't have a lot of money, walks into a, a used car place and this greasy used car salesman forces the wrong car down their throat, charges them more than it actually costs and doesn't explain to them that it's a lemon that's going to break down in two days. And he uses all these slick tactics to convince them of it. That violates like four of the tenets we just went over in the definition, right? Like yeah, it's yeah. the wrong person for that, for that, it's the wrong person for the wrong product. It's not a future result that benefits them. That's, that's scamming, right? The, and, and when you, if you think of every time you think of selling, if you think of that scenario, yeah, you're not, you hate that. Sure. I believe you. You're not good at that. Sure. I believe you. But that's not what we're talking about. And I, it's easy for business owners, especially getting started in business to think of the negative, to live in the negative, to live in the, the place where they're, all they're selling is going towards uh, kind of like tricking someone who's not right for what they do or what their product is into taking it. And the flip happens when you start to realize that there's people using your product who it's right for, right? Like, and 
And I think that that's an important distinction to get over is that like, what about the couple that walked into a used car place and didn't have much money and the guy helped them meet all of the needs they had listed with the right car at a good price and and it worked, right? Like when selling works, no one thinks of that scenario when they think of selling. Right. But when it works, it's actually something we all need. I need a salesman to inform me of uh, I need a salesman to match my wants to a product and they know the most about the products and sure there's an opportunity for them to do the wrong thing there, but they could also do the right thing. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Um, and it's interesting because it's, it's very easy to, I think it's very easy to look to the, the greasy used carman car salesman example and, uh, and make that your, and make that your, uh, your default, you know, definition. your default mode, yeah. your, your definition, your default mode of thinking, but that's not reality. Yeah. hundred percent. And, and it's, and it's like, it's rarer than you might imagine. Um, there's, there's so many instances where selling is something that we need. Like, like for instance, this camera that I'm recording this podcast on a whole bunch of YouTubers sold me on this camera over a different one. They sold me on it. I was actively looking for features that fit my needs and they told me all those features and they told me about how a competing camera doesn't have those features. They sold me on it and I bought it and I love it and it's made my life better. That's selling. <laughs> That's what yep. selling is at its core. <laughs> yeah. On a similar note, the microphone that I'm recording on right now, and if you're watching this video, you can see it. Um, I had a wide, I bought this microphone when I was probably like 18 years old or something. <laughs> and I had a wide range of options that I could choose from, from cheaper to more expensive to somewhere right in the middle, right on par. And I ended up being sold on it by a friend who had used it. And he talked to me about the benefits right. of it, why I would like it over, over the other alternatives that were put in front of me. Uh, it wasn't even a salesperson in the, you know, in the sense of, you know, somebody at Guitar Center who was selling me a microphone, it was an informed, you know, colleague of mine. Um, they sold me on the product that I ended up going with and I've loved it ever since. And they, and let's break it down again, guys, because you can put selling into a very specific negative context and always think about it that, that way, but you're cheating yourself if you do that. When Jack's friend convinced him to buy this microphone, he intellectually engaged Jack, who was the right person, in a future result that benefited him. And then, just by manner of conversation, compelled him to emotionally commit to taking action to achieve that future result. He sold him the microphone any way you slice it. Yeah, that's that's it in a nutshell. And, and I think you put yeah. it really well in saying if your if your default, if your definition is to look at selling as a negative because that's where that's where you think it aligns with you know your your worldview of business you're cheating yourself um i think cheating yeah. yourself is a really good way to put it because you're missing out you're missing out yeah and a, a lot of people like you may have had a sales job in the past that was sleazy cuz a lot of these boiler rooms that you can get a job at fresh out of high school or college are sleazy. They're the wrong type of selling. And, and that's probably one of the conduits that people, that causes people to look at selling through this lens. But right. it's not that. It's definitely not that. And there's selling doesn't, in that scenario, right? You're being handed a product, not only a product, but a method of selling that is inherently wrong for a lot of the people you're going to be selling it to, especially in the, the boiler room context. Um, but that's not what selling is. And selling's so cool because it starts at the product and offer creation level. It starts with thinking about the person you want to sell to, you want to serve, that you don't mind having an intellectual conversation about the features and benefits of a certain opportunity to, and then creating an offer that's perfect for them that you actually believe in, and then selling. And that is so much better than being handed some bullshit product and a and hundred numbers to call in the next three hours and trying to shove it down everyone's throat. That's not what selling is at its best. At its best, the offer, the product, the pitch has all been fine-tuned to a point where you're so comfortable making it, it's not even funny. I'm so comfortable 
recommending that anyone buy this Audient ID14 interface over any other interface on the market right now, unless they use UAD plugins a whole lot, then they should buy an Apollo Twin. But other than that, I will sell <laughs> this to anyone and I won't make a dollar of commission. That's how much I like selling. And, and you have that in you too, if you're watching this. There is a product that you would sell for no money. You wouldn't get paid for it. That's how much you believe in it. And that should be how you feel about any product that you that you sell. Yeah, I mean, I, going going to that, I hope for our listeners that they're that they have products, services, things in their life that they love so passionately that they want to tell all their friends about it. <laughs> I hope that you I hope that you've had that experience and that you can relate to that because um, I certainly have. Obviously, you have Cirque. Um, I yeah. think that when you start to frame sales in thinking that way um, and, you know, analyzing in, in your life um, and, and indies out there, if you're if you're thinking about music, think about the music that you've recommended to your friends. Um, it's it's going along that same lines of thinking that I think will open up a world of how if, if you're in a place where sales feels sleazy or the idea of selling feels like I'm never doing that um, by framing the things in your own life. In, in this kind of context, I think you can start to see the light at the light open up a little bit and uh, and hopefully it'll open your eyes to how cool um, this can be when you do it for yourself. Oh, yeah. And I mean, we spend so much time in the gathering phase, right? In the OK, we need to gather listeners and attention. We need to cultivate that attention into a relationship. And when we have the relationship, we're at the point where we could, we know that person so well and we've built such a relationship with them and we filtered out all the wrong people that we know exactly how to create an offer and a product that we we feel happy to sell to them. But I think so many indies stop themselves short of even getting to that point, much less really fully using that moment um, and, and taking Absolutely. advantage of having done all that work is, you know, you, you don't have to force something you don't want to sell down anyone's throat. The whole world lies ahead of you in terms of products you could select or create, at ways that you could bundle them or discount them or change the delivery method or anything, add special value to it to make that product into an offer, which the two are very, very different. And then take that offer confidently, having done all that pre-work, having found something you truly believe in, to that market and, and making a, a real offer. And when you have an offer like that in your hands for an audience that you know very well, all of the, all of the pressures of selling quote unquote, or the selling you hate that evaporates because now you're taking, you're, you're taking this audience interface that you've used and loved that you know is right for your friend who you know a lot about and just telling them why they need it. Yeah. It's so true. Like, and we see it all the time, like uh, both at the Indie X agency and in the Indies community, um, people who are building up huge email lists and, and Facebook messenger lists, and then they're not really doing anything with it. They're not making offers to their fans. They're nurturing them a little bit and kind of building upon these relationships, but take it to the next level. There's somebody in your world that wants something from you. They want you to make an offer for something cool that they would find valuable. They want to hear about it. Um, and I think if, if you're not taking advantage of that, which, we, which is something we so often see, um, you should be. <laughs> you should be making yeah. offers to your fans. And I would say that like you're not – you don't even – when people tell me they hate selling, I'm like, oh, no, you don't. You hate selling, you get paid for You'll sell tons of stuff and not make a dime, but once you get once you get compensated for the work of selling, you're uncomfortable. So what is it in you that causes that? There's some psychology we need to unravel that you're averse to the idea of being compensated for your devotion, right? It, it's like you've like uh, so many people will recommend products and and explain why they're right to their friends and won't get paid a dime. And, and it's like, what is it about getting paid for that service that you're rendering that you don't like? Do you not understand that you're rendering a service for them? Because that's, yeah. that's a different problem than hating selling. Yeah. You know, and that's super interesting. Um, maybe, maybe it goes into even a deeper discussion on, uh, just how, how musicians have over time, I think have become kind of devalued and have been told like, 
compensation isn't something you should expect. Take it to the idea of like, right. you know, pay to play shows or, you know, you're going to get exposure. Uh, exposure is the magic word <laughs> um, or, right. you know, has been has been touted as the magic word by promoters who are scamming musicians who are playing shows. Um, I think that there may be a leak of this into the into the psyche of musicians Um and then, you know, it, it's kind of leaked into their, their sales philosophy, um, or lack thereof. Yeah. And, and take this as an example right now, Jack and I are taking an hour plus the hour it'll take me to edit it. Plus the additional two hours, it'll take me to cut this for video and upload it to YouTube and create the podcast page, taking all that time to sell you on the concept of selling. Now we don't offer any trainings on selling as a principle. We don't offer any distinct copywriting trainings, although we, we should in the near future, we don't offer any straight line sales tactics trainings. We're not Jordan Belfort. But we think it's just so important for you, the audience who we've come to know and love, that we're willing to take that time to do it. And, and so even though there's no compensation associated with it, we're doing it, you need to do the reverse. You need to, you need to get comfortable with, with selling where compensation is associated. And if you've listened to everything we've set up until this point, you might be like, okay, I'm with you guys. I understand that you know if I'm a business owner with a product, um, that selling is an evil. And, and I get all the points you've made so far, but I am a musician with music and maybe some merchandise. How is that? How does that represent a future result that benefits fans? And I'd like to take some time to explain to you how it very much does, because it's very easy to misunderstand the value of music. We think of it as entertainment and it kind of stops there with this vagary entertainment. What does that mean? What does it mean to the average consumer? But the way I think about it, and hopefully Jack can provide his own unique spin on it, is that music helps me embody archetypes. When I'm listening to Otis Redding, I am Otis Redding. I'm, I'm a soul brother number one. You know, when I'm listening to Big John, I'm in the 1970s in New Orleans. It, you know what I mean? Like I, I'm that person and it makes my walk to work more pleasant. It makes when I get to the office more pleasant. And you know what? It actually makes me feel like my life's cool. When I listen to, if I haven't been listening to music in the morning for like a straight couple of weeks, I get depressed and I stop forgetting, I stop having as much gratitude. But when I'm able to, Spend time in my body, which is Da Vinci talks a lot about in, I think, podcast episode 89, which uh, I'll put a link to in the show notes. But Da Vinci talks about how your body's bigger than your mind. It is the higher power. And you don't spend a lot of time in your body, uh, tragically, not enough. And spending time in your body is when the brain kind of is, is put on idle and the music takes hold, and now you you are this character in your own movie. There's so much existential value baked into that. For the average outcast 90s kid, I would argue that the future result Nirvana provided was good for them. For the average grade school girl in the 90s, the future result that the Spice Girls and girl power provided was good for them. It brought them community. It gave them female empowerment. It gave them uh, something to talk about with their friends and, and create friendships over and something to be excited about for the future. It helped them embody an archetype that they couldn't have otherwise embodied without that music. And that's, that's a lot of the value of what you provide as a musician. Yeah, that's so good, man. I think, uh, I mean, all of what you said really resonates with me as well. And I, I just from my own personal experience, I'd like to embellish upon it a little bit. I think for me, there's been the experience of, of music has been like, uh, has had like a, a past, present and future effect on, on me existentially. Um, I think back to, you know, being in middle school or being in high school and listening to some of my favorite bands and hearing their songs, hearing the stories that were being told in those songs as a soundtrack to what was going on in my own story. So whether I could totally relate to it or not, and I was like, wow, this guy is talking about exactly what's happening to me right now in the present. Um, that was, that was something that, um, that always resonated really heavily with me there. Um, it was like, Oh, this guy's telling my story. This is a soundtrack to my life. I feel understood. That's really important. Um, as, and then as far as a, as far as like a future state, um, it, it always became about, you know, it, it kind of morphed into community. Um, like you were saying, it, it gives people a sense of music can give people a sense of community. Um, 
listening to my favorite bands with my friends, playing those songs, you know, starting cover bands. That was how so much of my time was spent as a as a young kid was playing, you know, pop punk Green Day Blink-182 covers in a basement. And that was there was a community being formed there uh, with friends and real serious bonds that were happening. And I was, you know, watching that happen and envisioning what it would be like to be, you know, out on the road with these people that I called my best friends. Um, there was a future state that was being built up in my mind. And the music that I was exposed to and was, you know, ingesting on a daily basis was such a big part of forming that that, that dream, you know, that big goal. <laughs> um, and I think that that's a really important yeah. thing for, for people of any age um, to associate, you know, associate the music that you're listening to with, with some kind of future state. And then now looking back on, you know, looking back on music that I was fond of in the past and maybe I don't listen to nearly as much, um, but allowing me to reflect. And I think like, look back on where my story, where my life has gone and where it's going um, and being able to reflect on that and grow as a human being. I think music allows you to tap into that. So like, that's kind of like my, my three point, like past, present, future uh, impact ideas that music has on me. And I think has on a lot of people, whether they realize it or not. Um, so <laughs> just as, you know, unique selling points for what music can do, if, if you're feeling like, oh, well, like it's just entertainment, I would, I would vehemently argue against that. Um, just from my own personal experience there. And I'm sure that a lot of people would agree with me. And I mean, the way Jack just described it, music is a time travel device, right? It, yeah. it tells you about who you are in the present, but not only that, it provides like, w especially in today, like so many of us grow up on movies and television and stories and narrative and every character in a movie and television has transitional background music that, that it describes their mood and it carries them from one scene of life into the next. And that's what music provided Jack there. It's, it described where he was at and it let him turn off his brain from being in that place and just exist there. And then later it provided, you know, time travel back to the past and rem and reminded him of the child in him and the teenager in him. And so that's, you know, it's very ethereal. It can be hard. It can, it can be easy to lose sight of that context, but that's what it provides. And among many, many other things Obviously, it's going to be different for you in, in certain small ways what the value of music is. But if you can find out what you love about music or what it provides for you in terms of value, then you have a nice starting point to understand how you need to sell it to your target audience, the right person for it. Yeah, definitely. Um, music, as a, music as a time machine, I think, is, is such a good um, – such a good metaphor. It's great. Cirque, I have a question for you. If someone's, you know, if you're listening to us right now and you're hearing all these points and they're, and they're resonating with you and you're getting over the hurdle of selling and you're, you're thinking to yourself, well, what do I do? <laughs> what is step one? What would you say, Cirque, for, in your opinion, uh, for a musician who's got, you know, a little bit of a fan base built up, uh, maybe they're, they're working on generating new fans, new listeners, um, they're building up a list of people that they know are interested in uh, what they have to do. Uh, what they're doing, what their music is all about, um, interested in building like this, this community with the artist. Um, what do you think step one is for someone who's never <laughs> dived into selling before? Well, I think I could point to a lot of great resources um, that, that can get you started on the journey of the, like all this stuff that, like there's no resource I can point you to besides us. That's going to tell you about selling in the context of selling your music but you can, now that you understand these concepts we're going over in this episode, you can go to these resources and really extrapolate what you need. One of my favorites is The Ultimate Sales Letter by Dan Kennedy, who's one of the greatest copywriters ever. Um, the Gary Halbert Letters is a, is yeah, a so, great series. So good. It's free. It's on the internet. So good. Yeah. Uh, the Robert Collier Letter Book is great. Um, it's a little bit more salesy <laughs> in that context, yeah. but um, it's great. And and uh, The Wizard of Ads and Ogilvy on Advertising. All these copywriting books really start to – once you get comfortable with, okay, selling isn't the negative thing I, I kind of framed it as. It's this. And 
I need to find a way to communicate the value of what my music can provide. And I need to get really good at knowing what that is. Well, you can, you can run drills on writing copy that sells your music as a general concept that sells your latest album that sells your concert and drilling copy. Obviously you can learn, you can learn to fly on the way down from a cliff. You could actually use the copy you're practicing with and only practice when it's time to write for something like you're creating a landing page for your album to sell it. And okay, that's when you practice copy, but that's not the best way, right? Like, you know, if you want to play soccer, you don't only practice at the games. Um, so you, you can really start getting the let out and, and really trying to make attempts, sit down at a computer and literally write copy blocks, three to five sentences that achieve different things or different goals in the job of selling. Um, I think a great place to start is like, obviously we want to review these resources. I love marketing is another great one, another podcast, but once you, once you're starting to come up to this challenge, now write a, a sales letter for your music as a whole like not your album, not a specific product, but just the idea of someone being a fan of your music. What's it going to provide to them? What corollary or story can they use to see themselves in that context? Now, you're never going to use this ever, but it's going to show you more about selling your music than I ever could, uh, that, that exercise. And getting that let out and then understanding what goes into a great sales offer, what goes into actually comfortably convincing someone of a sales opportunity. You can also review how you do this naturally in your own life. You can review how you've sold people on things you didn't make a commission on before. What did you do? What, why were you convincing them? What, how did you cultivate that, that, uh, that sort of bravery to just be like, no, dude, get this microphone. No, dude, get this interface. What did you go over the list of features and benefits? What was the angle, you know? And, and by deconstructing that, you can really start to understand how to sell your own stuff. Now, a great, all, another great exercise, because with music, we deconstructed how we value music and what it provides to us. And then we think about how could, for me, I think about how could the misfits have comfortably sold me on the concept of their music? What words would they have used? How could they have told me about this future state that I now embody? You know, how can I go back there and really think about it in that context? And then by, by really trying to imagine what that sales pitch would be like, you can start to understand what yours is. And, and then also do that for concerts, man. I can't recommend that enough because concerts are their own animal. And yeah. writing a sales letter for your concert is probably the easiest task for, in terms of copywriting for music because you've had concert experiences that literally you still remember that changed your life and that brought you a moment of surrealism in your life that lasted for months, you know? Yeah, definitely. I think, uh, I think, two things that you said that really resonated with me were one concert experiences for sure. There's concrete things, um, that you can, <laughs> that you can kind of extrapolate from your own experiences at in live music and apply that to your own. Um, and then two, just going back to what we were talking about, the interface, um, example that you gave or looking at, you know, looking at the things in your life that you've been, you know, that you've been so super passionate about that you've probably sold <laughs> dozens of your friends on it without even realizing that you were selling um, and applying that back to, uh, you know, kind of reverse engineering those ideas uh, into your own music and into the and into the offers that you make related to your music. Um, I, I totally agree with you. I think that puts you up that puts you in a place for, you know, successful thinking about things and not getting hung up on like, oh, well, like, how do I how do I talk about music? It's existential, like, go back to Go back to the places where you know that you are passionate about something. Get out of your head. Get in your body. How do things feel? How did they make you feel? Where did it take you? How did it take you from point A to point B? And then how do you apply that to, you know, your own music and how you talk to your fans about it? You really have to backwards engineer this, right? Because there's not a lot of context. There's not a, there's not a world of, of literature about this specific thing, selling your music. Uh, creating fans through through motivated language. And it's not something that's obvious either because it's not like you're gonna write a sales letter for your music and then send it out to a mailing list, you know? It's 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 going to come up 
every time you write a description for a video, every time you write text for an ad, every time you write an email, these skills are gonna be used, but not in the exact context in which you practice them. So the only thing to do is start learning, start practicing, start drilling, and and really start to understand and work out the kinks of how you would sell your own music. And I would argue there's no better selling that anyone does than when, when you believe in a product and you're not making a commission. When you believe in a product and you're recommending it to a friend, that's the best selling you've ever done and will ever do. And if you can replicate that, but for your music, for the right person, for your concert, for the right person, for your band t-shirt, for the right person, that, that brings it to a whole nother level. Another great conduit is to just think about uh, when I wear a band t-shirt, it tells my world, my outside world, who I am without me having to say anything to them, without me having to meet them, it it broadcasts my personality and parts of my life to the outside world, which is something we need, we need, need, need for societal navigation. In order to navigate society, we need to broadcast elements of our internal psyche to the rest of the world. It's It provides, there's so much utility to it that we could do like a two hour podcast on it. But knowing that, and you know it because you don't just buy the cheapest t-shirt you can find that won't disintegrate. You buy specific t-shirts. Uh, Gary Vee in that video said, "You oh, you buy, you, you'll buy another wine. You buy other wine all the time, but you didn't buy empathy. It's like, yeah, you're guilting people into the fact that you didn't sell them on it. <laughs> but but um, <laughs> But that's also true for your band t-shirt. People buy shirts that they don't even like, but they could have bought your band t-shirt. And if they're fans of your band, that like think about that, right? If you're selling a piece of band merchandise, you're selling it to someone who loves your music. And now you're just selling them on the concept of broadcasting that societally. Hey, what does your t-shirts that you're wearing right now say about you? What and and what is you listening to this album that you've listened to say about you? Wouldn't you rather say that on the exterior? Wouldn't you rather show the world how you are this, this, and this? And that that's an easy pitch to make too when you deconstruct it in that way. Yeah, I think it just totally goes back to again the idea of kind of what you and I were talking about about how music existentially affects people, um, and how how we were talking about the community that it builds. It you know. As a, as a fan of a band, um, like you were talking about the Misfits, like you're, by wearing their t-shirt, you're identifying tribally with them. Um, and, and like you were saying, like we need that as, <laughs> as you know, creatures, as human beings uh, to put out what it is that we're associating with, uh, what it is that we're associating with uh, in a way that's not always verbal or requires, you know, one-to-one -one human interaction. So, I think that kind of like floats back to the the existential stuff that we were talking about, but makes it a little bit more concrete. Yeah, I mean, I, and and this, I'm going to take a venture here, but I promise I'm going to bring it back around. If, if you watch Game of Thrones, like me, I've been catching up on it. I, I was the longest holdout, and I finally got into it, and now my wife and I are trying to catch up before the season finale on Sunday. But you see all these battle scenes, and you see these guys whose only job is to fly a flag that has the house's emblem on it. And you wonder, these guys are going to get slaughtered. Why are they, how stupid people were back in the day. And you think, I'm smart. I would never do that. If I had an army, those guys would have swords. But you're not so smart because you've completely missed why it's necessary for them to do that. Why do we have that tribalism? Why do we need someone to die on the battlefield because they were holding a friggin' flag that had our house's emblem on it? It, it provides a very meaningful tribalistic existential context for what's going on. One that's so meaningful that people will die for it. That's not stupid. That's not for no reason. There's a very good reason. And Jack kind of hinged on it when he was talking about tribalism. It's like you're broadcasting to the world what you represent, right? And, and that's all, I mean, life really is that. Life is figuring out how you will broadcast to the world what you stood for after you're gone. Like that's the meaning. That's, that's how, what makes life meaningful. You know, like I'm every, every week on this podcast, I'm broadcasting to the world what I stood for while I was on this earth, you know? And, and that's like, I know it can seem like that's a lot to put on a band t-shirt, but that's what it <laughs> is, dude. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah. It yeah, that's that's such a good I, I love the I love the Game of Thrones analogy and the and the the flag, you know, the flag bearer analogy. It's perfect. Um it it perfectly embodies what we're talking about here when it comes to tribalism in your music and how that's what you're trying to, you know, that's what you're trying to foster. Um, <laughs> so it, when you're selling, if you're the first person carrying the flag and you're passing it off to to somebody else through a dedicated offer that you know that they're gonna that you know that they're gonna take because you know your fans and you know what they're about and you know that they're connecting with you and you you're made building the offer up. specifically for them. <laughs> for them, yep, exactly, exactly. It's funny. I yeah. feel like we're kind of coming full. I feel like we're kind of coming full circle in the in the podcast episode here because now we're talking about how to how to connect your you know your selling to this idea of <laughs> to this idea of tribalism. And at the beginning of the episode, we were talking about well, hey, listen, if you say you hate selling because it's not mainstream and you're trying to carry the I'm not mainstream banner, <laughs> here we are, yeah. <laughs> full circle yeah, talking exactly. about ca- talking about carrying a flag. Yeah, exactly. And so I think we've outlined a couple points here that like, yeah, you're right. It, I can't just convince you that selling is an evil and show you a few copywriting tenets and point you to the right resources and you're all good to go. Because as a musician, you need to take it one step further. You need to enable your creative skills and apply them to the task of finding a corollary for your music or your, your music related product you're offering. So yes, we have to do a little bit of backwards engineering like we've done all throughout this episode to show you how you can find a method of selling or a way to get into the right mindset to sell a music product, but you can. And if you can't find the corollary for your music, selling isn't the culprit. You can't blame the craft of selling for the fact that you haven't done that work to figure out how to sell what your product essentially is. And, and I think that's what ends up happening. I think that to bring it all back to the root, that's why people end up saying they hate selling because it's such a monumental task to figure out how they don't. <laughs> yeah, it's, yeah. It, I mean, really when it comes down to it, so much of, so much of what we do in marketing is is ramping up for the sale <laughs> you know all of the relationship building and the to make it easier for people who don't want to sell that's really what we're doing yeah yeah that's what marketing is <laughs> yeah absolutely uh marketing or joe polish says marketing is selling in advance um yeah because yeah we're, we're i mean a lot like when we run a fan finder we're filtering out tons of the wrong people like 99 percent of the population to get to the right people. Then we're whittling that down further because people drop off while we're trying to create a relationship. The people who wouldn't ever create a relationship or, or foster a relationship with you, they drop off. So we're literally whittling it down until selling can't be evil. And then you just have to use your creativity to, to come up with the right language to trans and oh my God, uh, selling is a transference of feeling. That's another Joe Polish quote. You have to transfer the, you have to first cultivate the feeling, the feeling of, I, I know why this is good for someone. And I know a cer- certain corollaries that I could use to kind of like borrow concepts from. And I, I've made the offer specifically for them. I have this feeling that this is right for them and this is how to communicate. And now you just have to transfer that feeling of excitedness onto the right person. And I think, you know, all the marketing in the world can make that easier, but it can't actually do it. No, it's, it's all like, I, I like, I like the on-ramp, uh, image <laughs> the on-ramp imagery that's just getting you closer and closer to that place where now you just say that now you just say the thing <laughs> you yeah. say the thing because you know you're saying it to the right person with the right product and you know you're going to say it the right way because you know them and they like you and they trust you and that's what your marketing is working to do so just say the thing <laughs> Yeah. And we're, we've taken a lot of the specificity out of the concept of selling for you in this episode, because getting more specific about it or, or to be more specific myself and more accurate to think about it in the context you've always thought about it in when you say you quote unquote hate selling, or you don't want to be salesy that robs you of, of all the skills you would need to sell in a manner that you don't hate. 
But when you take the specificity out of it and you start to understand selling as a general concept, which I think Jack and I have done a good job of doing for you this episode, which is, you know, you, you do sell, you do great selling. You're a great salesperson, just not in the context that benefits you, right? If you take that specificity out of it, you can understand it at a general level and start to appreciate it and actually start to do it really, really well. And if you need a little bit more convincing, I'd say, I think a good place to close out would be like, listen, man, none of the things that you like about the time you're living in would be possible without selling the craft of selling and salespeople. Yeah, that's, that's so true. Um, I think if we had talked here in this podcast episode and gotten really, you know, tight in on the specifics of, of selling, we wouldn't have been in a position to, you know, hopefully convince people that selling isn't evil, but by backing it up to the high level and really boiling it down to the generalities and, and the, and the high level overview of what it means to sell and why it's not an unethical, evil, horrible thing to do, uh, by, by really nailing down the specificities of it, I don't think we would have been able to relay that, that same idea. Yeah. A, a lot of concepts are made, are made better by specificity. Like if I go tell you to run a Facebook ad, or I tell you to go run a video views campaign targeting X people and, and writing Y copy, right? That's a lot better than the first, than the latter or the former yep. rather. But in this context with selling, like the step-by-step, -step, the nitty gritty will, will, if you're already in the place of I hate selling or selling is uncomfortable or I don't want to be salesy, then you really need to back it up and take a 30,000 foot view because you start to understand how you selling is something you're actually very comfortable with that you don't hate. You just haven't thought about it in a wide enough context. Um, and, and it's important to realize that like everything you love about life is made possible by selling. Joe Polish says, or I think maybe even Dan Kennedy got it from Dan Kennedy says, uh, there's, there's probably no problem in the world that couldn't be solved with a great sales letter. And they don't mean like, oh, sales letters That's are so- That's a great quote. <laughs> it's, it's, and, and I really struggle to think of a scenario where it couldn't help, uh, like literally. But it's true, like it, it, because a sales letter, everything is a sales letter. This podcast is a sales letter. I think I said that the last episode too, but this podcast yeah, is a yep. sales letter. Any video you do is a sales letter. Your band, the t-shirt you're wearing right now is a sales letter. You know, it's selling the rest of the world on who you are. It might be, the signal might be weak or it might be strong, but it is a sales letter. Um, you're, you're constantly selling other people on concepts and, and to, to be sold is just to be convinced of something you previously weren't right. Or to receive new information yep. in a way that you accept it. And when you boil it down to that, it takes the scariness out of selling, but it, it is, it's important to realize that like, look, uh, NASA, medicine, fire, the wheel, uh, your blender, my computer, this camera, this microphone, this company, your music. Yeah. That guitar that you love to play so much. Yeah. None of it is possible without selling. Uh, the, the, the entrepreneur had to sell the engineers on working for less than they deserve to, to realize a future state The the, the engineers had to sell the manufacturers on manufacturing in a specific way, even though it was more costly, but it would yield better results in the end. The manufacturer had to sell the distributor on a method. The distributor had to sell their salespeople on making it their main selling product. And, and the salespeople had to sell the customers. Everyone's selling everyone on a future result that benefits them all the time. And it makes, it's what has made human advancement possible because selling is just language. It's just communication, transference of feeling through language. And the thing that's unique about humans and the thing that's responsible for all this technological advancement and civilization is language itself. The fact that we can codify and store experience in this context of language. And if you don't start unlocking that power, man, you're just get out of here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I think it, I, you know, I think it comes back down to back down to what we said at the beginning of this. Like if you can, if you can look at everything that we talked about here today and still say, nah, you're playing yourself. <laughs> You're totally yeah. cheating yourself out 100%. of out of the 
the idea of selling that we're talking about here is a really beautiful concept. And I think the examples that we've went over from, you know, the way that music has impacted us personally um, and how that relates to, you know, how it's been sold to us <laughs> um, as, yeah. as people um, down to the ways that we've recommended and sold products that we believed into friends and family and colleagues, um, all of that. And then just down to the idea of how selling has transformed the world. <laughs> um, if you're, if you're listening to this and you're still saying, nah, I, uh, I encourage you to listen to the, this episode again, <laughs> listen to it again on, yeah. on, you know, half speed. <laughs> Listen to it with another friend in the room and, and ask them if they disagree with certain points or try to try to come up with counter arguments because, Hey, if you're not going to accept our sales letter, then I need an objection, man. I need a valid objection yep. for why you there can't. There it is. Yeah. If you say you hate selling, it's because the only thing you've ever sold is yourself on the concept that you don't like selling, Right. It's a friggin' yep. <laughs> it's, it's I mean it's a mind warp, but yeah, you sold yourself on that idea that you're this person who hates selling. And you don't even I mean, when I was that person, I had yet to even explore what the fuck I meant by that. You know? I was yeah. just saying it because it sounded like a cool thing to say. And it was short sighted and I was a you know, little punk, but I, you know, I needed to be that at that time, sure. But I'm glad that I sort of open my eyes to what selling actually is at its root, which is it is effective communication. That's all it is. Yeah. So I think to, I think to bring us, to bring us back to our, to back to our, back to our indies and artists who are out there thinking about this stuff after listening to this, if you're looking to communicate with your fans in a way that brings them deeper and deeper and deeper into a relationship with you, uh, that's beneficial to both parties, um, take another look at selling and what it means to you. Um, look at the examples that we talked about in this podcast. Look deep within yourself. Obviously, so much of what we've talked about here is kind of uh, it's been a little <laughs> it's been a little esoteric, and uh, I think that that's a good thing. Um, musicians are highly creative people and very capable of thinking this way. So I challenge you to look at these concepts that we've talked about here, look at them in the context of your own, your own life, your own story, uh, your artistry and redefine what selling means to you. If you've got a narrow definition of it. And if you know Gary V's people or you are Gary V's people, or you are Gary V, I invite you to recognize <laughs> how you don't hate selling because you do it every day across billions of pieces of content and you sell people on the fact that you love empathy. You sell people on empathy itself. You sell people on certain modes of entrepreneurship and, and ways of doing business. And you just failed to sell people on empathy. The wine, man, you don't hate selling. You're a, you're a salesperson and an effective one. And, and so anyone who's ever said, I hate selling is forgetting about all the times that they've been great at it and have done it gleefully. So, so, um, you don't hate selling, man. You're actually pretty dang good at it. And if you just put your head down and start to apply that skill, you'll do some amazing things for yourself and other people. Yeah. I love it. <laughs> I love it. That's all I have to say. <laughs> it's so good. Yeah. And with that said, uh, I've been Circa for Creative Juice. This has been Jack McCarthy for the Indiex Agency. And I hope you guys have enjoyed this little uh, this little uh, rant from the both of us. And we'll see all of you next week on Creative Juice. Peace out, Indies. Happy selling, Indies. <laughs>